Hey everybody, we are Robert, Martin, and Francis, and this is Snakes and Otters, pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Welcome back, this is Snakes and Otters, we're doing episode 34 tonight. This is an Our Heroes episode, and we're going to talk about Vincent Van Gogh tonight. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. All right, gentlemen, this is halfway through the month of January already. Where does the time fly? Oh, yeah. 2020 is a great year. That's right. The year of snakes and otters. The year of snakes and otters. That's right. So tonight we're going to look at uh, Van Gogh. Van Gogh is one of my personal all-time favorite artists. Uh, Has been since I've been in high school. And uh, he's he's such an interesting story for a lot of reasons. And I use that word story very, very deliberately because we want to circle back to that. Uh, at the end but so for those listeners who don't know a whole lot about van gogh look him up you should uh Mm -hmm. vincent van gogh uh he is best known for uh the sunflower paintings probably Mm -hmm. Uh, starry night starry night is probably the single most famous painting a matter of fact i have a partial print of that uh should be hanging in that wall but i've got to put it up uh it is a takeoff of the TARDIS from Doctor Who exploding. Oh, yeah. And, and in the episode a, they did on him, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, that was in a later episode, I think. No, actually, I think it did appear at the end of... The, it, no, it was a later episode. The, yeah, that, yeah. that whole year had a, had a lot of that yeah, put yeah. through it, but yeah. But anyways, um, he's well known for Starry Night. He's well known for uh, self-portraits. Uh, he's well known for being basically crazy. Uh, he spent some time in, a, in a, an asylum... His brother Theo had to support him because he only ever sold one painting in his entire life. Uh, he was uh, a joke when he was alive. And yet today, money-wise, he is the most successful painter that ever lived. Mm-hmm. His paintings have sold for more money than any other artist. It does help that his paintings can actually be sold. You can't sell Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. This is true. So this is true. Contrary not, to what not some quite people a fair would, comparison. But, well, yes, well, but but don't you want know, to minimize him by any means. Rembrandt, Picasso, I mean, Gauguin. These are, these are people whose paintings and their works are worth tons of money. Mm-hmm. But Van Gogh brings in even more. Right. That's right. Yeah, he's at the top of the heap. He is. So it's interesting. The, probably the least successful artist who eventually became famous is now at the top. He would never have believed this, just as they showed in that one episode. In that Doctor Who episode, yeah, it's a, which uh, was very good. Because he was he was tortured. He didn't think he was good, mm-hmm. and no, no, neither did anyone else. Uh, but he kept doing it. Uh, that is truly the true soul of an artist. Theo believed in him. Well, yes. Theo, Theo not only supported him uh, financially, but Theo did encourage him and did believe in him and tried to bring other people into the That is fold. true, yes. So there were people who... who did believe in Van Gogh during his lifetime. Leonard Nimoy did a marvelous uh, one-man play back in the 70s uh, where he played Theo, and he talked a lot about you know all that, what you're talking about, mm-hmm. that agony that he faced for his brother whom he loved, mm-hmm. uh, but he couldn't quite understand. And, uh, and for those folks that have suffered with mental illness, that's a common theme. Mm-hmm. People don't really understand them because they don't understand themselves. And yet... They can still produce such amazing geniuses like Van Gogh. The um, interesting. Go ahead. You, you're oh, I was just going to also mention that uh, again, dying at 37, uh, his output's truncated. But even more than that, it's it really is a 10 year period. Yeah, I mean, it's not like <clears throat> most. Well, of, he was a kid. It, yeah, I, I mean, he was an adult really before he takes off. Um, the so most of his paintings were done in the last two years of his life. Yeah, so it's it's like two thousand so canvases. His, and 10 he was years. in his prime, as yeah. they say. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the the amount of work that he did, it's not a huge amount compared to some artists. Uh, but for the amount of time that he was a yeah, practicing actively, artist, yeah. it is phenomenal. Um, and he's got two different periods. He's got his early period when he was living in Holland uh, with Theo. Um, when we first started painting, it was very dark, very Dutch. Yeah. When he goes to France... Muted colors. Very muted colors. Very, lots of browns. Mm-hmm. Dark uh, more palettes. of a realistic... When he goes to France, and I think is uh, influenced by the Impressionist uh, mm-hmm. uh, movement that is going on there, 
I don't know how much of the. I'd have to look at the dates. I don't know how much of the post-impressionist movement is going on yet. Uh, 18, but he's a, 1886 is when he goes to France, okay, in Paris, and he meets Gauguin, and that's where uh, he was reacting against the impressionist sensibility. So it was in full force at that time. And well, he's he is at the heart a of a post-impressionist, post-impressionist. exactly, yes. very much so. It's yes. and that's but because of the connection with Gauguin, because uh, that's kind of what he did, right? So the inter- I want to talk about. Um, his art in particular, uh, to start here. I mean, I think that's enough background because I think most people have a sense of who he is. Crazy painter. Mm-hmm. Cut off his ear. Cut off his ear, sent it to the prostitute. Yeah. Uh, when you look at his art, it's almost a relief sculpture, right? Because mm-hmm. it has a 3D quality. When you look at one of his oh, canvases, yeah. you can see where he has layered the paint in such thickness. That I mean, you can literally see not brush strokes, palette knife strokes. He put a lot of paint on his painting. Not every painting, but some of them he actually used a palette knife to layer the paint onto so the canvas. So it's very three dimensional. It is yes. Uh, it's not intended to give a three dimensional effect. It's just the right. way he layered the paint. Yeah. If you look at the masters like a Da Vinci, the canvas is smooth. Now, right. Now part of that's the painting process where everything basically gets shellacked. For lack, it's not true shellacking, but there is a coating that they put on top of those those paintings. So it, it has still a very flat right. surface. Mm-hmm. Not so with, with uh, Van Gogh. <clears throat> His use of color is probably the one of the most innovative because it's not just coloring like inside, you know, they don't color inside the lines, but you know. It's not just this dress here is blue or mm-hmm. the sky is blackish with these little dots of light for stars. He uses color for motion and emotion. And it's just a phenomenally different way of yeah. looking at things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I we don't know because I don't know of any writings he left that would describe, even if he even knew how, given his mental state of mind, yeah. uh, how it was that he saw Things like this, yeah. but I think it'd be fascinating to read. But is it is a brand new visual language? It really is. It's different from the other post impressionists, and I mean, you look at Gauguin, you can see there are some similarities, mm-hmm. right? Because it's not uh, a very photorealistic way of doing things. And the impressionists weren't either, but they were closer to it. Yes, than... they're the bridge between that period of of the kind of that last period of realism in painting is that sort of that. Napoleonic mm-hmm. Delacroix mm-hmm. group there, right? And and then after is this complete insanity departure <laughs> from yeah the complete departure from a a, a realism in in painting and more towards. I mean, that's when you have the Cubist movement, yeah, Picasso working rock, rock and, and, and and then you just move on. Well, to Edward Munch, you know, uh, the scream, the, the scream. Home Alone painting. <laughs> yes. right. So so Van Gogh is this pivot of this visual language changing um and we talked about well i'm probably stealing your thunder a little bit Mm, here but um you know we've talked before about how things don't happen in a vacuum right he's this is a product of a time in europe that is dealing with change as well you're post all of the 1848 revolutions you're Post the emergence of a Germany that's a whole. Right. The Franco Prussian War. The Franco Prussian War of 1870. Yes. The it's humiliation of France and Napoleon III. So you. Italy is now a full uh, yes. complete country. So there's massive political changes going on. There's this, this, all of these strains that we've talked about that lead to World War I. This is all going on at the same time that he's become this artistic rebel as well Mm -hmm. pushing against the boundaries of of visual arts and the interesting thing about him is that he was still known granted nobody took him seriously other than a a small circle yes but they weren't they you know when it's just your brother and a few friends you know you're not gonna make any money um but he was still known maybe because he was crazy uh maybe because he wouldn't give up he's also a bit of a drinker you know yeah Uh, that Tends to go with that that state of mind, uh, you know. Where he, he, I don't know that he did drugs because I don't know how much they were available to him then. But you know, in France, there's lots of wine available. 
and certainly probably uh, hashish or opiates. Right, there's going to be some available. opiates. Yes. Well, yeah. Also, also uh, philosophy is coming to its own because this is the era of Nietzsche as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that are happening because it has been peace for you know a, you know 15, 20 years now. Uh, there, Europe is able to founder this, foster this intellectual renaissance in many ways. Yes, Freud's coming. Freud's yeah. coming, exactly. This is the early days of him. And I would call the this period, this 1880s-ish, give or take yeah. five or ten years or so, this is the 1960s of the 19th century. Oh, I like that, yeah. Because mm-hmm. uh, there's, there's that experimentation going on, right. at least in France and in the art world. Right. Um, I don't know anything about music at this time, but I imagine there's probably some you know, societal, creative experimentation going on all across the board. Mm-hmm. Yes, music. Women being, are getting rid of their bustles. Yeah, M- music is you know? being decoupled you're from, wearing, you're not wearing from a the church. <laughs> you know, so yes, you're right. There's 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 revolution in everything. Right. In right. in all parts of uh, culture and society. So yeah. that's an interesting time frame for him mm-hmm. uh, to be going coming about and, and doing all of this, and yet he still can't get any success. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder um, if that's because of who he, you know, how he was or how he did things. I don't or know. Just too radical. I, it's. It, I mean, when you're this much of a visionary, nobody's ready. Well, for it's that. not like he's trying to sell it anyway. I mean, he's too busy painting. You know, he's not a marketer. He's not. Well, no, but I mean, if you're a painter, um, you know, you're probably still going to want to sell your stuff. You're still looking for acceptance into the uh, what is it called, the salons and the and right. the, um, uh, the the. the I think for him, it's the probably not so much acceptance as validation. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. You know? I mean, yeah. you're, you're still, I am good. What I am doing is you're good. You're still seeking those shows and those displays and, and being in the galleries. Right. Yeah, but his mental state was such. Yeah, he probably would not I, have accepted... I don't think he could have gotten that far. Uh, I think he's doing what he's doing out of his pain in many ways. Well, yes. Depending on who you talk to, some will say that you can't be an artist if you, you know, if you don't have mental anguish or pain or suffering. I think that's bullshit. Agreed. I think Marty's is bigger than that. Uh, but we remember those, but because they te- because they tend to be the larger than life people. That's correct, and they and they tend to go places that are a little bit more memorable, but because they're not the same. Well, and you know, the interesting thing is those that don't have those crazy qualities, for mm-hmm. lack of a better term, I don't mean that to denigrate anybody who has mental health issues. Sure. But those tend to be the artists that we remember, mainly maybe because they're the ones who don't sell out. I'm using the air quotes there. Yeah. Because the sane ones, they do good work, and they become commercially successful. Mm-hmm. And with rare exception to those who become commercially accept, uh, successful are considered true artists. Yeah, Tolstoy was like that. He became a part of the establishment in Russia. I mean, he was... For writers. For writers. Look at somebody like uh, Stephen King in the modern age. Most successful commercially successful yeah. writer in probably the entire 20th century. Mm-hmm. Yet, many people still think he's a hack. Yeah, because he's become the establishment. To them. Because well, he sells so much. I well, it, I don't know as much that he, he was very rough early on, but you know, he, yeah. he never did uh, what they call um, um, not commercial fiction, it's literary fiction. Uh, right. Which sounds odd, it sounds redundant. But, you know, when you write for the sake of the art, as opposed to writing when you, genre. Yeah, when you write stuff nobody will buy versus writing stuff that people will buy. Well, that's that's very well put. Your novel that... Ultimately, that's what it comes that down to. It sells a thousand copies versus... Right. Versus... If you wrote Pride probably, and Prejudice today, yeah. it would not sell. It's, a, it's, a, it's an example of a literary fiction work of art. But it's a love story. Mm-hmm. But if you write a love story... Mm-hmm. You frame is that way. You may come up with a very similar story, but you know it's a genre. You know, what for whatever reason, the genre stuff is looked down upon. But everything has a genre. Yeah, exactly. So with him, you know, I don't know that he looked at selling his work necessarily in that way because again, he's doing it because he has to. He's you know, compelled to do so by himself. Painters paint, sculptors sculpt, writers write, musicians driven, yeah. write music, play music. Yeah, that's the, the word, the, the drivenness yeah. that, that he has. So, to this day, even though he was not successful during his life, he became successful. And today, as we said, he's one of the most successful artists that ever lived. Everybody knows something Everybody about knows him. something about him. Everybody would recognize his paintings. They may not be able to say, yes, that one's a Van Gogh. But if you said there's a Van Gogh, you say, oh yes, I, yeah, that's a Van Gogh. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, most people, probably some that wouldn't, but yeah. 
they're probably not listening to us anyway. <clears throat> so why is he so fascinating? Mm. Why is Vin- why did Vincent Van Gogh become a success after his death? Why is he fascinating as a person? To me, that is. I mean, never mind the fact that I love the art. Right. To me, that's the fascinating thing here. Mm. Why is he so fascinating? Why is he so interesting? Oh, uh, for for me, it's because he is that quintessentially broken person. Mm. His mental illness to me is what makes him so compelling because he you you feel empathy and pity for him because the Doctor Who episode brought this out very well. He cannot overcome this. There's just no curing him. Not and <clears throat> that's what made him great, but it's also the tragedy. You know, some of those Shakespearean plays, it's the tragedy that they bring with them. That makes them who they are. That right. tells the story. Van Gogh is that story. Uh, he, it could not have ended well for him. He was just too consumed by this mental illness. But he's also a great moment of hope. Because for those who suffer from mental illness, they need somebody to say, they did it. They made it. They worked through this. And yes, it may have killed them in the end. But they matter. They created something great. They yeah, created something great. They left something behind so great. Because yeah. the way you put that probably doesn't apply directly to him because he did commit suicide. That is correct. So uh, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, it was, but but the but the reason he did that was because of the torturedness. Yeah, yeah, of his yeah. mental illness. But I mean, despite the mental, despite the fact that he committed suicide, he managed to contribute something of great beauty and something worthwhile. Out beyond of, the times right. that he lived, beyond himself. Out of that brokenness. Yes. Now, that's an argument we could have. I think that, in many respects, his genius was inextricably linked with that brokenness. Oh, yes. Martin, what do you, what do you have? What would you, why would you say he is interesting? Yeah, I mean, because it has, for us, of course, it has to go even beyond that. There has to be a heroic piece that is meaningful for our lives. So that's why we do these hero episodes. Yeah. Um, and I know it, it. We wanted to do this one especially because, hey, you're our art major. That's true. That's true. Yeah. You, you know, so I knew it would mean a ton to you. But you know, I'm a digit head. <laughs> so, you know, at at, at old Bellerman College, when they say, "Well, you got to take art history," I I was worried. Really? I was like. Oh, I'm not going to be able to do this class. This is going to be difficult. And it turned out to be wonderful experience. Yeah, absolutely, an amazing class. It really was. I enjoyed it tremendously. Liberal arts education. It really it has given us so many gifts. Yeah, and I, I even still have my textbook from that class 30 years ago with Professor Haney. Um, and I, I still marvel at at the paintings in that book and. You know, for me again, and the this outsized accomplishment of being this great revolutionary, and that it, that transforms how we see art, hmm. um, because we we talk, we even hinted about this when we talked about comic book art and Jack Kirby. Kirby's the Van Gogh. Yes. Of comic mm-hmm. books. Yeah, He absolutely. captures <coughs> motion and intensity in his comic art, and that's Van Gogh. That's Van Gogh for me. Intensity, movement, motion, you know, Starry Night, mm-hmm. or Wheat Fields and Cypress Trees. It's not just a painting. You're standing in the wheat field. Right. Mm-hmm. You're, yeah. You can feel the wind moving those trees. Even though when you get close enough, you cannot see anything except the little globs of paint. It's so yeah. thick and... Yeah. So it's... It, yeah. So Pretty amazing stuff. It is. It is. So before we get to mine, <clears throat> I just want to mention that uh, today, for this episode, we are trying a brand new bourbon for us. Yes. Yep. And actually, it's a relatively new bourbon in general. This is not... I mean, the distiller is an old distiller. The bourbon itself is Devil's Cut. Now, it's billed as the bourbon that is squeezed from the uh, uh, from the casks that other bourbon is aged in. Right. Uh, it's yeah. the Devil's Cut. 
Uh, you might know the commercials that uh, Mila Kunis does, uh, where she gets her name stamped on the, the barrel. Mm -hmm. um, I got it as a Christmas present. God love that man who gave me gave Amen. this to me. And uh, it's got a bit more bite than I think we're used to. A long finish uh, we've talked about. A long yes. finish, but a good finish. And it's not one that's going to make you start coughing. Right. Uh, I mean, unless you have a hard time with, with whiskey in general. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't start somebody on this particular bourbon. But It's a mature taste. It is. It's got an interesting flavor to begin uh, mm -hmm. that is unlike, I think, most of the other bourbons we have. It's not sweet exactly. No, but no, no. It's it's a uh, it's it's just a different different flavor. It's very yeah, a uh, wonderful explosion of flavor mm -hmm. that stays with you for a while. Yes, That's, this is not a mixing bourbon. We, we've learned a whole lot in in our in our bourbon drinking and tasting explorations explorations yes. as we go through here, and it, it's all subjective. Of course, we're by no means uh, knowledgeable to the extent we'd like to be in this, but we know what we like. Yes. And we can describe what it is that is good about mm -hmm. these things. And this one's pretty darn good. And yeah, that's this right. one, yeah, it has kind of a, I don't know, the oakiness, the the the, mm -hmm. not as much of the maple type syrup mm -hmm. or maple syrup type flavor, right. um, and not medicine-y. I always right, reject right. the medicine-y ones, um, but the woodsy mm -hmm. and, that's good. and yep. earthy uh, uh -huh. flavor, and then like I said, the warm kind of is early. Yeah, and yes. then it stays with you for stays, a while. And then it's yes, just... it takes a while to get down there. Yeah. Unlike Angel's Envy, which um, you, the, that warmth doesn't really explode until it gets down into your throat, into your stomach. Uh, right. it's not, whereas this starts in the mouth. Uh, yeah. There's probably some, there's probably been some really good papers and uh, science done on <laughs> the difference between where yeah. that taste and that warmth sure. I mean, the, happens. The, but... the bourbon industry is famous for all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah. How they, how they but work through this. I highly recommend this one. It's yep. not my top favorite. But it's up there. Yeah, this is one I yeah. would go to with no problem. Absolutely, it's good. Okay, it has yeah. it has a lot of the same qualities as like the larceny that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has the, that really good mature woods woodsy flavor. It's only ninety proof. That's a relatively low end uh, for a. Yes, uh, it's not going to knock your cap off. No, <laughs> no. All right, so back to Van Gogh. <laughs> you were so, saying, sir, why I find Vincent Van Gogh so interesting. Part of it's the art. When I was younger, when I first got into uh, my first art history class in, in high school, uh, we did Van Gogh. It just floored me. I was just fascinated by the art. Mm -hmm. But I think when we come to Vincent the Man, why we find his stories and why that has lasted. Because, I mean, there's plenty of great art that mm -hmm. uh, you know people study, but you don't necessarily know the story about the man himself or the woman herself. It's more all about the art. With him, it's together. You cannot separate the two. Right. His is a great story. Because I think his art evokes raw emotion. Yeah, his story yeah. of the, it just evokes yeah, that's a, where I was a raw emotional yeah. response. It's visceral in many ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we we compare how we look at him to somebody like a Caravaggio, whose craft mm -hmm. of, as an artist we admire. How he does light, mm -hmm. you know. He he we he, we know him for his technique. We don't really necessarily know him about him as the man. Uh, right. Same thing, you know, something like a Vermeer, you know, st sticking with that, that Dutch. You know, we know a little bit about his life because uh, he painted everyday scenes from his life. But we know him still explicit, mostly from the paintings themselves. Right. Uh, with Michelangelo, uh, my all-time favorite artist. Mine too, actually, yes. Um, you know, with him, it's, it's also both. It's his life, the type of man he was. Uh, but we also recognize the sheer beauty of what he creates. Uh, oh yeah, it's a different kind of emotional response, and you know, I think with Van Gogh because of that brokenness, I think a lot of people can see themselves in that. Oh, okay. I think that because you can't separate the art from the artist in Van Gogh, I mean, you can, but I think you miss out on a lot, right? He doesn't, he doesn't strike you as a professional artist like Michelangelo did, who that's what he did, and that's what he did, and, and that's where he was, and. People saw him as that, and and people can't reach that. That's beyond them. But Van Gogh is accessible. He's he's authentic, in a certain way. Uh, yeah, he's, I wouldn't say that the other, you know, something like a professional, like a Michelangelo or Caravaggio or yeah. court painter, is not authentic, or not professional. No. But it's like to me, it's that visceral. You know, it, it's a more of a gut level thing. Um, you don't and, have to be an art appreciator. You don't have to be knowledgeable of art to appreciate Van Gogh. 
like you do others? Well, I think, no, not necessarily, because the Caravaggio or Michelangelo, I don't think you have to be knowledgeable about art right. to, to recognize it as good art. But I think it's just his story. I just go back to the story of Van Gogh and, you know, the, what he's famous for, the cutting off of the ear. And we know, I think, a lot about him from what he painted. Mm -hmm. Lots of self-portraits, lots of paintings of his environment. Mm -hmm. We have paintings of his room. You know, a little one-room shack or... His uh, bedroom at uh, all. Yeah. Very famous, yes. Those are some of the most famous paintings and most sought-after paintings that he did. Almost no heroic subjects. Right. It's all everyday ah, no, scenes. Okay. No, nothing like, again, Delacroix or the, the you know, the scenes of, uh, what is it? Uh, There's no Washington crossing the Delaware. Yeah, no, no, no Marat in his bath. Right. No no political statements. You no know, Romulus taking control of Rome and things like that, like some of these other right. mythic heroes would... would... Right, right. It, it's, it's, again, this this moment of revolution where things can be pulled apart, pulled out of, I don't have to do pietas. I don't have to do the religious subjects. I can mm -hmm. do anything. And his subjects are, are you're right. Everything around us, mm -hmm. everything around him. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even the self portraits he, are real and raw. He yeah. does a self portrait after he cuts off the ear. You know, there's the one where he's got the big bandage. bloody bandage right, wrapped yeah. around his ear, yeah, uh, in his head. He did portraits of of the postman. Yeah, uh, uh, he he made the mundane heroic. That's a very good way to put it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he what made the mundane, and maybe this is what made the art appreciated later um, because because you can't separate the man from the art because the man is so sad and pathetic that makes it hard probably to to recognize the art because you look at the art and you think oh my god that's sad and pathetic because you think the artist is sad and pathetic right but when you realize that he took the everyday places where you live where you walk play a room just like the room you mm -hmm. sleep in and did what he did with it you know, maybe that's the turning point for those that started him down that path of being famous. But to me, you know, it's just that whole idea that we can see. And I, and I think this is one of the things that a great artist does is not that necessarily we see ourselves in the artist or uh, the painting, but we make a connection to the piece of art. So when I look at yeah. Michelangelo's Pieta, my all-time favorite piece of art. I'm sure I've said that on the show before. And getting to see that in Rome in person mm -hmm. a few years ago was the highlight of the trip for me. Yeah. Looked forward to that more than anything else. And getting to see that because of that, just because that that beauty, that craft, that precision, that I know kind of effort, uh, only a small piece because I could never do that. I, I don't have that skill uh, I don't know that I could practice long enough to have that kind of skill. Um, but that touches me. Mm -hmm. And good art does that. It should, yeah. Bad art, and yes, there is bad art. Some will say there is no bad art, it's just art. Well, that's a load of crap, too. The, the guy who, who the banana ducked, taped to the wall. That is not art. That's that's bullshit. That is, that's a, at best, that is a performance artist yeah. who's saying, I'm really, I'm really screwing with you here. Yeah. Because that's, that's not art. You're not. Yes, you have arranged pieces of the mundane into some new configuration. And some people will tell you, well, as soon as the artist is done with it, he no longer has any control over what it means. Well, no. He doesn't have any control over how you interpret it. Right. But the artist still has say in what it means. And. No, I'm sorry. There are some things you cannot give good meaning Sometimes to. Sometimes the emperor does have no clothes. Exactly. We yes. transform the mundane every day when we. Eat. Yes. I'm transforming the mundane food that I eat into nourishment. That doesn't make it art. Right. Well, that's right. And other byproducts. Yes. <laughs> I well, was wondering how deep you were going to go yes. with that. <laughs> it might make it that, but it may exactly. not make it art. So that connection that, you know, art that touches us, an artist or a story, mm -hmm. uh, especially someone who's broken that still produces something great, that's a great story. I know I talk about stories a lot, but, you know, stories are in everything we do. Mm -hmm. well, it's the Vincent human, Van Gogh's the life and the story of his art from a failure to a success, it's a hero's journey story. Ah, 
There you go. That's thank you. That's that's what's been. That's where I was getting to. That's why that's I was talking been, story. Yeah, clicking around in my head here. It is the hero's journey. Yes. Even though it doesn't end well for him. No, but not every hero's journey does. But it depends on how you your perspective on that because. Take, well, take personally, his, it doesn't take, always end. Yes, that's right. Take his hero's journey and do not stop at his death, but begin. From you there. have to go beyond. You have to go beyond that. Look at where his his journey, his personal journey, may have ended long ago, but his hero's journey still continues. And the impact that he that is has, the, the impact of the yeah. life, and a good hero's journey story will have that. Mm-hmm. So you take any hero's journey story, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Star Wars. Mm-hmm. The impact of a Luke Skywalker or the uh, Bilbo Baggins and what's the other Frodo, Frodo, Frodo. Aragorn, yeah, Aragorn. all of the there's yeah. lots of those, uh, lots of them. Tony Stark, Tony Stark, that's exactly right. Yeah. You know, oh my God, Tony Stark. You know, he's he's a perfect example of that that the modern person could probably relate. Yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be the fun part of the next phase of the Marvel movies is Stark is now a galactic hero. He's not just a hero on Earth. He's a universal hero. Yeah. He's a unit. Yeah, he's then you know the name Tony Stark will now be known on every world. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be a fun part of the. I mean, digress here, huge, but that's going to be a fun part of the next phase of the Marvel movies. Assuming that they capitalize on that and they they oh, okay. smart enough. I was going to say, yeah, they, we got to, this. To, yeah. to pull that into these that's next right. movies and. But that's the hero's journey. Yeah, you know, and it's only just begun for Iron Man. Right, and that's the same thing with Vincent Van Gogh. You know, he he struggles. He wants to give it up. He threatens to give it up constantly because yeah. he thinks he's no good. But he's driven to keep doing it. And it is in that drivenness, that absolute unwillingness, ultimately, to give up. And then even though it looks like he has failed, he really hasn't. Right. He's had massive success. And... While he doesn't get to reap the benefits of it during his life, Mm -hmm. for somebody like him, that doesn't matter. Right. He was done. Yeah. The the transformation is is complete. So for me, you know, that story of him and the impact, as well as the beauty that the man created, is it's the total package. It's the total package. That's That's super, man. That's that's awesome stuff. And that's why he's your hero. A hero, a hero for me in these sense. When I talk about guys like this, it's hard for me to to say, yeah, he's a hero. But it's because I think a hero is maybe I'm too grounded in superhero stuff. But his life is meaningful. But to yeah, you. he has meaning. Well, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Because when it, we talk about heroes, it we we aren't caged with that definition. We broad that broaden that quite a already, bit already. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. is one Someone. of the great influences uh, for me. Yeah. Yeah, um, his just life because is, I is, love the art, even if it's just for me to be able to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, my life is better because I have that beauty or that ability mm-hmm. to to view it, even if it's just on a tablet screen or a cheap print that my daughter bought me as a present. Yeah, you know, not that she bought me a cheap present, but I mean, it was an inexpensive. Yeah, you know. but just the, yeah, the the seeing his work, you stop. You know, yes. you can walk past a lot of go. Oh, okay, that's neat. That's neat. I mean, even Rembrandt, Vermeer, Vermeer. You, okay, let's go. Okay, I gotta stop here. What was Vincent really? What did he see? Right. What did he see that the, the rest de- of us don't the see? The depth of that is there. The hidden depths. Yeah, is one of the things I think that makes him attractive to us because you're right. Some things you see and they are themselves. That's it. Vincent was never just what you see. It was much more. Vincent Van Gogh and his art, because I love the way you put it, because I'm going to segue into what we're going to be doing next episode. Yeah. So next episode, we are going to be doing our pop culture, and we're going to be talking about the movies that we always have to watch. Oh, yeah. So the way you just phrased that about Van Gogh's art, it's the same thing. you got to stop. Art we have to stop and look at, no matter where we see it. Got to mm-hmm. stop and you, Michelangelo and and make you think Van Gogh. What did Van Gogh? What what was he? I don't see that when I look at the night sky. Right. What did he see? I'm lucky to pick out the the constellations. I just, no, I can't do that at all. I mean, I saw Orion last night and think, oh, hey, there's Orion because yeah. you know you see the belt and yeah, yeah that one's easy that to one's recognize. Really, Big Dipper, I always have a hard time with. Yeah, yeah, it. Uh, you know, much less the Little Dipper and all so, of the others. Uh, amazing. So anyways, painting. 
Anything else we want to say about him? Because, I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, we didn't even talk about anything other than a couple of his paintings or anything else, but... You know, it's an audio podcast. How do you describe that's Van Gogh's right. art? I think we've done a pretty good job with that. Yes. All like, I can hope is that whoever listens to this, they're inspired to go look up Van Gogh, read about his life, and look at the paintings. And not just on a tiny little phone screen. Look at it on as big a screen as you can possibly look exactly at. Right. Uh, if, see, History of Art find, by Jansen. Yeah, see if you can find a second-hand copy of History of Art by H.W. Jansen, Volume 2. Uh, very good uh, discussion of Van Gogh, and there's some color uh, plates of, uh-huh. of some of the paintings. Uh, Time Life did a uh, series of, of artists 40 year, 30, 40 years ago, something like that. You can still find them. And as a matter of fact, turn right around behind you. Well, I, I knew I had it around here somewhere. Uh, nope, first one, first one. There How about that? And it's in a slip cover, the one I have, but it is The World of Van Gogh, 1853 to 1890. And it's his own book. Yeah. It's his own book. And gosh, I haven't even looked at this in, in so long, but see, it? the dark period. Yeah. So anyways, uh, there's plenty of material out there that you can find. Mm-hmm. And it's just amazing. The, this, the subject of this is often found in those coffee table books you find in your local yes. bookstores. Uh, take some time to browse those. You'd be amazed what you can pick up for very inexpensive that really do show some of the great oh, yes. stuff that we've got. Fantastic. Yeah. So a large color plate of wheat fields and cypress trees. Go find some art by Van Gogh. Go find some art by anybody, especially somebody that, that evokes that emotional response in you. So do that. If you do that, this will be one of the best podcasts we've done. Amen. Because I like it when we touch people. We, we t- getting people moving to explore these topics on their own. That's right. You got it. So you've already uh, you didn't you didn't kick our next week to Francis. I did because it, it played right in with what you said. I had just, to bring that up. We just roll with it. So, no problem. Remember, next week, episode thirty-five, we're going to be doing pop culture, and we're talking about movies that we always have to watch. Yep. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter. At Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us. And please, remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel.